Hello everybody, welcome to this last presentation in this section of biogeography and today we will talk about cold and hot spots of world's biodiversity and my name is Divna. So concerning very limited resources that we have at this moment like money, also urgent needs to protect what still can be saved out of the world biodiversity uh, just think of extinction rate in the past decades. We need some serious thinking and calculations, basically uh, how to protect as much as possible biodiversity with the least of the effort. Of course, effort in a sense of space and money and time spent. Um, in the end of 80s, in the of the 20th century, British ecologist called Norman Myers, he developed this concept as an answer to the question thus to address the dilemma that conservationists face and there will be what areas are most important for preserving species uh, basically the least to invest and the most to gain or in which areas would a given dollar contribute to most start slowing the current rate of extinction and the perfect fit answering these questions was a biodiversity hotspot concept so as you can see, we can define a hotspot as Earth's biologically richest and most endangered terrestrial ecoregions. Um, certain ecoregions of the world exhibit both high species richness and also endemism. So Myers defined these regions of unusually high diversity as hotspots. Designation of the region as a hotspot of biologically diverse uh, space is based on two factors. Uh, first would be overall diversity of the region and the second would be the significance of impact from human activities. Criteria for calling an area a biodiversity hotspot is mostly defined by plant diversity and it is biological basis for hotspot definition because plants have been easy to define and census as well as providing the basis of, of diversity and other uh, taxonomic groups. So, so to qualify a hotspot, a region must support 1,500 or more endemic plant species, and also the region must have lost more than 70% of its original habitat. And the other reason why plants are used as base for qualifying a biodiversity hotspot is that they are most of the time in the basis of the food chain and they support basically every major land hotspot. So basically hotspots because of, because of their uniqueness and irreplaceability they present natural capital for the whole world mostly based on their great and hyper productivity and it's more than obvious that places like that are very rare on the planet. So those hyper-productive places. Altogether, there are 34 biodiversity regions of Earth that have been designated as hotspots by IUCN, uh, containing altogether 50% of all plant species and even 42% of all terrestrial vertebrate species in only 2.3% of the plant's land area. Um, several hotspots are tropical island archipelagos, such as Caribbean and Philippines, or also relatively large islands, such as New Caledonia. On this map you can see old named 34 hotspots with their name and geographical position defined by IUCN. Next to these island hotspots, a nice example for a terrestrial hotspot would be a Mediterranean basin here, but the, their flora is, we can say, dramatic. It has 22,500 of endemic vascular plant species, and it's more than four times the number found in all the rest of the Europe. Um, the, this hotspot also supports many endemic reptile species, but as Europe's vacation destination, populations of certain species are increasingly fragmented and isolated to make way for resorts, development and infrastructure. So Mediterranean, for example, monk seal, 
Barbary Mosque and the Iberian Lynx, which is critically endangered, are among the region's imperialite species. Also, Japan, taken as a, an example of an island, it has more than 3,000 islands in its archipelago, which means which makes Japanese archipelago, and it stretches from humid subtropical in the south to the boreal zone in the north, and this results in wide variety of climate and ecosystems. Uh, about one quarter of the vertebrate species occurring in these hotspots are endemic, including critically endangered Okinawa woodpeckers and the Japanese mosque. Uh, the famous snow monkeys, they are most northernly, northernly living non-human primates in the world and so on. But also due to high development, economical infrastructure is getting more developed, civilization is spreading more and more, so the habitats are getting fragmented and these already endangered species are in even bigger threat from human activity. Habitat destruction is a pervasive threat affecting hotspots and it's already causing extinction in many areas. Uh, accelerating anthropogenic climate change will undoubtedly magnify the effects of habitat destruction and fragmentation. So predatory invasive species have already had the devastating impact on the island hotspots where species evolved in the absence of animals such as cats and rats and we talked about it. For example, uh, when we talked about Australia, how their fauna completely evolved without proper mammal predator species and they suffered a lot when new invasive species were brought to the island. Um, introduction of exotic plant species into hotspots is ready already known, uh, particularly those of Mediterranean type of vegetation, is also having massive ecosystem effects. Um, direct exploitation of species for, for example, food, medicine and the pet trade is a serious threat to all hotspots, particularly in Guinean forests of the West Africa and several Asian hotspots. Um, another great concern is the severe decline of amphibians worldwide the cause of which remains unknown, but we know the numbers and they are getting really uh, disturbing. Uh, the most direct measure of this threat can be derived from assessment of the conservation status of species. So the IUCN Red List of Threatened Species compiled the Species Survival Commission of IUCN uh, the World Conservation Union, and they classify species that have a high probability of extinction in the medium term feature as critically endangered, endangered or vulnerable. For mammals, birds and amphibians, three groups of species for which assessments of distribution and conservation status have been conducted, we can measure these proportions with a high level of accuracy and this is one of the tools of how to describe a hotspot or how to measure their use in the sense of protection by diversity but also the particular species or a tax of animals. So to count and to animals particularly but also to assess their availability in the field if they're vulnerable or their populations are stable and so on. So this is the the agency that works on this problem is called IUCN or the World Conservation Union and they're the same group that defined these 34 hotspots that you can find here. So a bit more about IUCN red list of threatened species. Uh, this uh, lists provides taxonomic conservation status and distribution information of plants, fungi and animals that have been globally evaluated. And you can find this in their website and dependent on their level of protection they're put in certain categories and of their red list. And you can see the categories uh, written on the screen for different, different uh, level of endangerment so, for example, extinct would be the 
no unknown individuals remaining, I think in the wild would be species that are only to survive in captivity or as a naturalized population outside of its historical range. The critical endangered is extremely high risk of extinction in the wild species. Species marked as endangered they have high risk of extinction in the wild and vulnerable species they are threatened by high risk of endangerment in the wild near threatened is species likely to become endangered in the near future least concern would be the species that we have low low risk for so does not qualify for a more at risk category and it's widespread and abundant tax are also included in this category and then we have this other problem that some species are put only because of lack of data and it's called data deficient so not enough data to make an assessment of its risk of extinction that's a really dangerous category because you know nobody knows what what is going on with that populations of the certain species and also not evaluated that species had not yet been evaluated ag against the criteria and it's usually the case with um, for example insects or other smaller uh, organisms that are really hard to make an assessment about their population and their habit assessment goals of a red list are formally stated goals of the red list would be to provide scientifically based information on the status of species and subspecies at a global level. Second, to draw attention to the magnitude and importance of threatened biodiversity. And third, it would be to influence national and international policy and decision making. They also said they would like to provide information to guide action to conservation biological diversity. So basically, the red list is just a tool of a future plans for protection as well as hotspots which obviously are really rare tightly connected some areas as a um, biodiversity are also maybe not so high in biodiversity but are important for a certain stage of some animal development for example uh, in the sea areas where fish are hatched so they're vulnerable and it's a place of let, let's say meadow that they're hiding in and so on so that's why they're even though it's not really visible and after a lot of studies they show their importance in the fluctuation of biodiversity and keeping their richness really high so altogether, IUC and Red List is a direct tool in providing assessment and conservation efforts regarding biodiversity hotspots. And why do we need them? Here you can see if you go how it looks like if you go to IUC and Red List. So just to explain, you can see the species Latin name, their picture, and their category. They're fitted in due to the evaluation of their numbers. So basically how their population is doing on the field, it's a long way down. So if you scroll down, you can see some other facts about the distribution, um, maybe some feeding information, digestation, and so on, some kind of ecology areas they could be found. And here, classification um, of taxonomy some other classifications and stuff but this is what the red list is most uh, important and most famous for so these categories like as you can see Pantera Leo or a lion African lion is put as a vulnerable species so basically it is at high risk of endangerment in the wild at this point one more type of biodiversity spots we mentioned in title is called biodiversity cold spots the concept their concept is relatively recent so it was found in 2003 and it was introduced in basically conservation ecology as biodiversity cold spots so opposite to hot spots we just talked about these are called the cold spots. cold spots would be areas with a low level of biodiversity thus by this criteria they are opposite to hotspots. 
But on the other hand, the reason why the, they represent areas of special care for conservational scientists are their level of endemism. And it is most mostly really high. Since cold spots are usually abiotically specific habitats, they are not exactly providing high level of biodiversity. So on the other hand, hot spots can be said that they are mostly in these tropical areas. Cold spots are usually on the higher latitudes area with not so appreciated abiotic factors. So not providing high biodiversity, but they do provide high endemism level. Since their abiotic factors are not really appreciated, just a bit of strongest and most adaptable species could survive in those harsh environment and they adapted in such a high level to the specifics of that habitat that they cannot be seen anywhere else in the wild and became endemic for the area of the specific with the specific let's say climate or water availability or some other lack of uh, essential matters for the rest of the world which these strong species adapted to and just because of them areas of biodiversity cold spots they deserve a special conservation status as well as biodiversity hotspots some example of the cold biodiversity cold spot would be a pacific temperate rainforest and it's located and on the west coast of northern america and some amazing examples of adaptation to this type of cold spot would be um, evergreen trees or some subspecies of bears also for example bald eagle you can see in the picture or a sitka deer that could be found only here okay that will be it on the section of biogeography from the next presentation we will talk on some other topics so if you are keen to find out what's next see ya then in the next presentation thank you for listening bye